Welcome back to Automation, the car company tycoon game. It's sure been a while, but I'm ready for another Let's Play. We're going to run a car company and see if we can become the best in the world. We're only going to have a tiny budget, but we're going to rise from the bottom and get to the top. Maybe. It's now version 4.3 Ellisbury updates, patch 2. I waited for patch 2 because there were some major bugs in patch 1. I wanted to start this a little earlier, actually. But it's time to go now. The votes are in, and the theme of our car company is going to be something between tiny ship boxes and family cars. Now, what better country to start in than Ruinia, the Italy analog in automation's fictional world of car buying countries. The small, hilly, urbanized country with narrow roads and mild weather. So people here like small cars. There's a lot of city and commuter car buyers. So we're gonna make some teeny tiny cars and they'll be fun. We'll sell them. We're naming our company Carota. That's just Italian for carrot. I'm very creative. And the difficulty, we're going to set as high as we possibly can. I've got insane difficulty here is a 16.5 score multiplier. But we're going to bring that score multiplier up to the absolute maximum of 100 as difficult as possible. So let's suppose we start with a couple plots of land and a tiny factory already. That's, you know, we... We own a failed scooter business. We have a factory ready to go. We want to make cars instead of scooters. We have no money. Zero dollars. And it's going to be a difficult world to compete in. The competitor companies have good engineers and be giving it their all at 130% desirability multiplier for the competition. It kind of makes up for the AI generating so-so cars to compete with anyway. And that puts us at 100x with a little wiggle room. So the failed Corona scooter company gave us a little design knowledge in, in car bodies. We have a little bit of forward thinking style. A little chassis design knowledge. We're spending our little bit of excess difficulty, still at 100 times and a small distribution network. You can uh, buy Corona scooters or cars at your local general store, at the, the department store. They have a little, little display. They'll be selling a couple cars. That's gonna be our business model starting off. We'll have to expand in a real dealership still. In fact, we can bring competition down to 128. That's right on the edge of 100%. In fact, if I wanted, oh, I could get engine technology. Here, here. Now that that'll be right there. 130 percent. Couple crucial points of tech pool bonus. And we start with a tiny factory. So that start with a tiny factory is the best uh, thing we can do. The the only way I think I can start at 100x without going bankrupt. They made it a little harder to get loans. So it's better to have that factory than to try and take out a loan and build one. Congratulations on starting Karota. Your family connections have granted you access to a level one car dealership network. You sell cars in Fruinia. The year is 1946. And you have access to Hetvasia, the neighboring country as well. Be sure to invest in marketing. You certainly will. Well, if we can afford to. And the game will conclude when the year reaches 2020 attempt to score as many points as possible. You've seen automation before, you know the drill. So our starting target demographic will be the city market. They're quite large at 10,000 buyers with, uh, we can overlap some too. There's city premium, city budget, city eco, which is uh, a main focus on fuel economy. And commuter and family cars can have some overlaps. We have a lot of people we can sell to. 
If we limit to our current market awareness, though, there's only a few hundred buyers who will actually be seeing our cars on sale and have the option to buy them. We'll have to spend money on marketing to improve that. Now, I planned out our first car ahead a little bit. The one tech pool and body we spent will let us use bodies from 1947. And I have this 2.2 meter one in mind because crucially it has a hatchback option, which is the body style that uh, city buyers want. And it looks good. Now, since we have big dreams and no money, our only option is to build cars out of aluminum. We don't have access to steel because we need to invest in steel presses. And we just don't have the money for that. In fact, they have to be in a larger factory as well. So we're going to make uh, aluminum because it's something we can work with by hand. That's going to make each car more expensive. These won't be the budget chip boxes that are our dream. You know, to, to make a car for everybody. It's going to have to be a little more expensive at first, these cars we're making. We're going to turn a profit anyway. Ladder frame, that's the cheapest option we have. Very simple. It has steel. And sadly, the ladder frames prevent us from making any rear engine cars. That's why I really love to do. That'd be really on theme, like a classic Fiat 500 or Beetle, but it's going to have to be front engine. And we will go for a double wishbone in the front. That's the more expensive uh, type of suspension. It's very comfortable, drives very well. And we have the choice of either spending a little more to get double wishbones in the rear as well, which will make our car very nice to drive, or trying to save a little and go for the semi-trailing arm, which is the, the much simpler option. As I'm looking on the left here at the difference in prices, I'm leaning towards going double wishbones all around. It, it costs more, but we're already spending a lot on aluminum body panels, so we might as well go whole hog. And our engine will be a small four-cylinder. Now, starting in Fruinia, we have uh, already familiarity which gives us an engineering time discount on certain types of technology. Inline four-cylinder engines are the biggest one. Sadly, not boxers. So that's what we'll be making. That's what we... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what kind of motors we must be putting on our scooters, but apparently we're familiar with four-cylinders enough. Or at least that's what they were making before the war or something, was four-cylinders with a direct acting overhead cam. That's uh, no rockers, two valves per cylinder only, but it's an overhead cam. I have a classy high revving European style, but still pretty low tech. Oh, and the size of the thing, it's gonna be small. Nice and small. We can uh, square maximum size at 1.2. Maybe make it uh, almost 1.4 liters. See how this does. Harmonic dampener is a must have for almost any engine. It doesn't cost us much and it gets us more stability. So we can rev higher without breaking our internals. I guess some of these tunes before we go ahead Low cams, moderate compression, low springs. This is we we want fuel economy out of our little tiny ship box car. It's for families. One wimpy carburetor. That's a uh, economy or oriented carburetor. I don't know how big that's going to be. And. Intake and exhaust are tuned for the, the lower RPMs. That's best for fuel economy. 
So in, in patch one of the Ellsbury update, there was a bug. This blue dotted line is the power threshold. Above it, we lose reliability for making too much power in our little engine. And uh, it used to be halved. So even my tiny engine with a low tune would be like threatening to break itself. It's bad. So right now we're making about 40 horsepower. I'm pretty happy with that. We're gonna want to get a little bigger carburetor. Smaller exhaust. And let me work out the fine details of the tune here. But at the end of the day, what we have is basically the most fuel efficient engine we can build with 1940s technology. Uh, 14% almost thermal efficiency is pretty good for starting the game off. Look at our flow chart. It's a little choked at max power. That means that it's really, you know, optimally tuned for airflow at the lower end, which is going to help our fuel economy. And it should be just powerful enough to haul this thing around. Rear wheel drive is our only practical option. Uh, I don't think we even unlock front wheel drive until later. I have a two speed transmission open diff, hard tires, and cross plies. That's another awful thing to start the game with is cross ply tires. They just make everything worse. We can actually fit five whole seats in this thing, like a proper family car. We'll see how that works out. Our interior will be premium with a radio. In, in 1946, a premium interior, I'm not entirely sure what that's going to look like, but uh, it, it's more than just your absolute basic seats. You probably get yourself a little glove compartment and stuff. That's an extra feature back then. Rack and pinion steering, that's the, the more responsive one. Uh, I don't know. I think last time I played, certainly, we didn't have different types of steering. So recirculating ball is uh, an older type that's kind of smoother and comfier, but it's a little sluggish. Rack and pinion, something that's more used today. And uh, manual, you know, no power steering. It's pretty responsive, sporty. And Fruinian buyers like their cars a little sporty, even if they're not sports cars. They want that responsive feeling. Put the best safety features we can into it, which in the 40s is to say uh, safety glass and bumpers. Very high tech. Hit normal tune on suspension. We need to tweak some of this a little bit more. So give him it to tune out the fine details once again. The first thing I'm doing is picking the car's ride height. It's going to be optimized for entry and exit. We have this practicality stat here. I found that the peak practicality is at a ride height of 365 millimeters, which looks goofy tall, but that's okay. And uh, that, that's to make the car easy to get in and out of. We'll tune the rest of the suspension around that ride height rather than picking a ride height that's going to ride the best. We'll adjust everything else accordingly. Stepping up to 14 inch wheels to get some bigger brakes. That's going to help with our brake fade in the top right here. We can have our, our brakes be as big as we can get them. They're drum brakes, they suck. We want as much brakes as we can get. And we can afford to reduce the pad type, which will make the car a lot more comfortable at the cost of, again, some brake fade. So if we have bigger brakes, we can afford softer pads before brake fade. That's the brakes overheating. It comes to be a problem. 
And we're just going to tune the brake force of each set of brakes to be around where the grip is. As you can see, the front wheels have vastly more grip because the weight's on them with the engine. Springs, we've got a little on the stiffer side. Handling's a, a bit of a compromise between drivability and sportiness. If uh, you haven't, you're not familiar with this graph, the uh, if it's in the red zone, then when you steer the car, it'll rotate more than we are steering input is. That's oversteer, spinning the car. And blue zone is understeer, pushing, plowing, scrubbing. You, uh, you steer the car too much and it doesn't steer. We've got it pretty balanced towards uh, if you input too much steering, it's just going to end up going in a straight line. It makes it easier to handle, but less sporty. And if the D is right on the blue line, you get maximum drivability multiplier. That's the stat that makes the car easy to drive. People like that a lot. If the S is right on the red line, that's the, uh, the sportiness is not our primary stat. We like to have a little bit of it. Spacing out the wheels and our body roll under control. We probably want about five degrees for this car. And our last big tune is gearing. I think we're only going to have two speeds. High gear is going to get us to our top speed of 70 miles per hour. Not bad, I might say. And the also very new in this update, advanced gear setup, lets us go to some extremes for our gear ratios. Uh, there's a new grip calculation that's uh, basically giving us a stupid amount of drivability if we transform our car into a one-speed car with no gear for accelerating in. But we're not going to quite cheat and take advantage of that. We're going to give it something with reasonable gas mileage that looks like a real gearing graph your first gear runs out to a lower speed and actually accelerate using it. So we have a blistering 0 to 60 time of 32 seconds. Our drivability is pretty similar to the competition. More sporty, less comfortable, more prestigious. I think that's due to our aluminum panels and stuff than an average city car competitor in 1946. Lower safety, Aluminum body panels and ladder frames are both bad for safety, so even our advanced safety features don't totally make up for it. And I have also gone ahead and taken the liberty of designing the visual look of our first car ahead of time here. So let me try pacing this in and see if it works. Morphs are in from my car designer version. Shoes are in. Paint. So there's what I designed in the car designer at a time got headlights, blinkers. I've chosen a brushed aluminum texture instead of chrome. Above our metal accents. I think that kind of accurately represents our uh, budget construction here. The fact that we're using aluminum. I'm trying to keep this car cheap. Got a very simple build. Flat piece bumper. We've got a pretty little carrot logo. Offset. And for our Main top of the line car, we have this lovely carrot orange. We have uh, some exposed rivets, again, showing our car's a little handmade, a little crappy. And I think this will be the, uh, the face of Kurota. It's a little orange car. We've got to pick out some wheels, too. Those don't transfer. So there it is. Kurota. Uh, let's call this car. Do I have any last tuning stuff too? 
got gearing, we've got wheels, we've got brakes. I think we're looking okay. Our desirability factor for the city market is 75%. As I say, it's not necessarily as good as some other cars. But I'm hoping it'll be enough to get us into business and keep us out of bankruptcy. So this will be the Coniglio. And our main trim here, orange trim. It's our upper level, our premium interior, Primo. Now we're also going to make a second version of this. We're going to offer a version with a standard interior. So less sound insulation, less nice seats and no radio at all starting off here. And that's just going to be our cheapest option possible. We'll also distinguish it with uh, a, a new paint. It's going to come in a uh, blue color. That's that way too intense. Chill, chill that out here. There, I think that's the, the less dramatic counterpart to our orange color. But our our 1940s style paint with uh, no flake in it, so it's just a glossy flat paint. Only a thing here, if the uh, Remo is our is our best car, what's the cheap version? Yes, the Merde should do. As a lovely name for our entry level option. Now, all together, we're looking at 28 months I guess, to put this together. That's quite a while. Let's, oh, and $6 million. That we can't afford. So first off, I crank the funding down. Almost three years put together. So we're going to have to simplify our tooling a lot. That means we're doing less work to make the car easily built on the assembly line and more stuff just to be finished by hand up the pressure, we're going to do less R&D and more just getting the car out the door. And get the car out in 24 months. Hopefully that's fast enough. Maybe not. Maybe make it like 20 months. There, we went from an original budget of something like $6 million of engineering. Uh, we are, we're changing our work strategy around to get this done like cheap. We're using this $115,000. And that's good because we're going to need a loan for every dollar we're spending. Remember, we're starting with just a factory and a closed down business. Engine. I've got a got a rename. What's the heart of the rabbit here? We need a fun name for the engine or just a numbers name? It's always hard for me to decide. That kind of sets the aesthetic of our whole company. Uh, keeping the theme of clumsily borrowing Italian words. The Maratona will be our first engine family. The, the Marathon four-cylinder. It's definitely going to keep running for a long time, you guys. We didn't cut any corners engineering it. Uh, now to cut some corners engineering. Actually, we don't have to do that. It's going to get done in four months right now. We need to get done in 20 months. So let's see. Take the money out. That's done really cheap. Even crank up our tooling slider. We're making design changes that make it easier to build in the factory. And we'll probably leave it right there. Now, we have a plot of land for an engine factory. We're not going to use it. We would need, off the top of my head, I think about $50 million dollars to build an engine factory. And again, we have to get a loan for every dollar we're spending. And our company valuation, that's just our plots of land in our tiny factory we start with, uh, is about $4 million. So we can't really take a loan that's much more than that. So we're going to have to establish a contract. Someone else is going to build them for us, and they're going to charge us a lot more than uh, what it could be. $3,000 per engine in a factory that probably costs less than half of that. 
in a factory that we own, I mean. It's gonna add a lot to the cost of the cars. That's just uh, how it is starting off with a small company. Until you can go big, your costs are very high per car. And they're a tiny factory. Uh, first thing we can configure is our shifts and our workers. So, we don't want to run more than two shifts. As to say, uh, more than 16 hours a day. Uh, there's actually a penalty. I don't think it explains this at all. But uh, I know from talking to Discord, your tooling takes additional damage if you run more than two shifts. So we probably almost never want to do that. And uh, in fact... Just max out 1.5 shifts because I think we're gonna have a hard time selling all of our cars and a minimum of 0 0.5 shifts. Now we have to hire 110 staff, looks like. So we're going to crank up our hiring standards, we want good workers. Basically, the fewer staff you need, the easier it is to get good workers for cheap. And we're even going to underpay them a little bit. Or a lot. There, it's going to take us a little more time to get off the ground and hire all our workers. But we're saving a chunk of money per car. By being uh, jerks. And insisting on high quality work for low pay. Now, because we cut corners in our engineering and we're in a small factory, it is most efficient to take some automation out of our tooling process and make them more handmade. See the efficiency percent go up on the left here as I take some out. Uh, we have to balance that a little bit with the cost per car, which is uh, going to increase as we have to hire more workers. See, man, I'm not really... Sometimes when I make like a car with a handmade interior, you actually get more cars if you drag this down. For this, even with a 35 engineering automation, uh, we're not saving a lot. Let's just leave that where it is. Make 37 cars. And for not too much money, relatively speaking, we're spending like $100,000 just on the engineering budget. That's cost us uh, $120,000 to tool up our factory. If we crank our tooling quality up to 90, that's going to get us more cars for cheaper. And it's going to be very worth it. And lastly, increase the QA threshold just a little bit. Because I don't want our reputation getting damaged by a recall. Yeah, so the average uh, budget of a city buyer in Frenia is $7,800. And our estimated cost to produce, uh, including tooling and stuff, is uh, 8000 So we have to sell this for, like, more. There, that's going to be narrow margins at 11000 for the Primo and 9500 for the Merde. Uh, honestly, that's not a great amount of savings going down to Mare Day level, if you ask me. But uh, well, the forecaster's telling me I should increase my price. I'm not sure if that's going to come out being true. We'll really make more money based on that. We'll, we'll have to see once we start selling cars. If we're not selling enough, I'll lower the prices. But uh, the forecaster says I'll do better if I do 12000 and 10000 the nicer and cheaper model. And I'm also going to ask for a higher deposit because I want money coming in before the factory is done so we can help pay for advertising. So there's our plan. In 20 months, we will be manufacturing cars. And I'm going to take out extra loan money. There are, the bank's willing to lend us more than the projected project cost. I'm going to take a long time to pay that off, 72 months, because our, we're, we're going to start off slow. I know this for sure, because we don't have very many dealerships. I don't want to be having to pay off like a, a big payment right away. 
And this extra money, we're going to spend it on advertising. Now we're on the timeline. It's just going to scroll to the left until we reach the end of this yellow area. And then we will have finished developing the car, building the factories, and they'll be on sale. Let's take over one month. And it looks like, ooh, that's rough. We're getting $5,000 a month. That's from the extra loan money. If it was, uh, if I chose 100%, it'd be close to zero. The, the loan's going to pay out during the course of the project instead of all up front. Now, let's talk marketing, because that's crucial in our dream of going from being a nobody to profitable car company have a market awareness which is apparently growing even on without spending money on marketing so seeing each market right now we are limited to three percent of its total size see there's you know for Winnie alone there's six thousand city car buyers every month but some of them or 193 are aware of our brand so we can't sell more than that so we have to grow our market awareness. Now, each market has different car stats that they care about. We basically market our cars based on uh, a car stat. Drivability, that's the biggest one for everybody. Uh, but the cost of it is more based on how many markets care about it, how many people care about it. 16,000, we can't afford even level one drivability market. And these go up to level 10 be spending eight million a month on that one stat what we can do that's cheaper and that properly targets our city demographic the market based on a minor stat footprint size look how small our car is uh even that's gonna cost us six thousand four hundred which is uh more than our monthly so we will we'll start putting out little flyers saying by the Corona Knigbu. It's so small. And we will uh, hope that we start getting orders to pay for those advertisements before we run out of money. Aha! Our first the order Someone has put down, uh, I think it was 20%, so $1,000 as a pre-order on one Corona Coniglio Primo. 1946 model and that's paying for our marketing for this month thank god this month we have another pre-order another three look how much of a difference that makes five thousand dollars it's not a lot of money for a car company but it's a lot of money for us a defunct scooter company hoping to sell cars Spend more on marketing. Let's go to us two. And it causes a little more growth in our market awareness. Our cars are small and they save gas. You can't buy one yet. They're not we're not making them yet, but we will. Worth it. Order today. Oh yes, let's hit the drivability one. All the markets spending our pre-order money as soon as we get it what's most of our profit margin per car 27 pre-orders this month that's almost one a day little person at the department store uh, a mock-up model of our car they haven't built any real cars yet it's uh getting almost one buyer a day to put down two thousand dollars as a pre-order that's telling us that our, our little car company really could be successful. And now in September of 1947, our car has completed engineering. Uh, I haven't actually made any yet. Next month, October. Now we are delivering cars. Our car factory is 
staffed. We know that. We saw it would take a few months to build up staff. Build quality is good because we demanded high quality workers. We're getting a desirability bonus for that. And uh, another thing, I talked about marketing a lot. So actually selling cars is going to increase our market awareness too, not just spending money on marketing. So the more cars we sell, the more cars we can sell. And we have pre-orders that are going to take us months to fill at the current rate. And that's good because we don't really want to start building up stock. That's going to cost us money. Yes, we're building, getting $100,000 a month. We have a million dollars in the bank. We're millionaires. <laughs> Taking our broke little factory and get lots of money off of it. Uh, so we're currently limited to one and a half shifts. I'm going to crank up this little tool here to two whole shifts. To hire more workers, build more cars. All right, now we're on pace to fill out our pre-orders within a year or so. Everybody who wants a Conigio Primo can get one. Even take a little look at uh, what it's like to actually drive one of these things on the road. Uh... Broda Company's very first automobile. Now in Fruinia, on the lovely island of Iagistella, we can test drive the first edition Coniglio Primo. long in the gearing. You can see it works pretty well on narrow streets. Almost past two cars on the bridge like that. On the downside, I think you'll find that second gear, the high gear, is uh, useful for flat ground only. It really is kind of a scooter car. The first gear gets you to 30, and that's most of what you'd spend your time doing. I still like it. Little care badge. I did okay. Now, before our sales slow down too much, we'd better make an update of the car. And that's also going to kind of update our tooling costs and uh, give us the option to lower the price, which will help us a lot, too. Call it the, the B type. This is the second version. I don't know it will actually change a lot. Now, uh, lightweight pistons could go there and gain some fuel economy, but we're making a little much power for them. We lose, we lose half a point of reliability. I might say that's worth it. So I tried running the engine lean, putting less fuel into it, and it doesn't actually gain us much fuel efficiency like you'd think it would, maybe because our compression is already pretty high. It's the, the new fuel efficiency model. Uh, we have a map of the whole engine RPM throttle, and then the highlighted dots are what's considered during the driving test. See, they get up to, like, high throttle, low RPM. That's probably going into second gear all the way up to the high RPMs, just the whole thing. 
hearing the car better could help us with that, but, you know, it is what it is. You know. Still at about 42 horsepower. I don't think I can much better compromise, but uh, I can add, let's say, a couple points of quality to the exhaust. That's pretty cheap. Another point of quality to the carburetor. That's pretty cheap. I'll make our engine more reliable, more efficient, more powerful. Everyone likes it. Let's see, we've had one and a half labor hours and $20 in materials. Gain 0.5% efficiency, relatively speaking. It's like 5%. It's quieter. It's more powerful. I'd say it's worth it. All right, three-speed transmission. I think that helped our drivability, fuel economy, even so more reliable by adding a gear. I'll take it. Bills. A little lower profile. That's relative. Still at like 95 profile. And it helps the fuel economy a bit. Just a tiny bit of tow in. I don't, I don't think we've unlocked really we unlocked anything. We don't even have standard AM radios yet. So nothing much is going to change. One quality point. Always classy. Replicate all those changes to the your car. That's my least favorite chore in this game, is copying everything. I have this new feature, though. I can see engineering options, what's used in another car. If I know that I use three speed, it helps me not forget or something. But uh, actually copying the gearing setup is going to be some manual. Okay, I think they got that out right. 25 miles per gallon. I think that's pretty good. Probably. But something. We're looking at a turnaround time of only 4.6 months. So we're going to spend longer. Get our tooling up. All right. I think I can handle the loan for this. It's a $2 million development cost, which is about what we have for our cash on hand. Uh, 13 months. Just tweak that a little bit. Nah, I don't think I need to change anything. And for the engine, we won't be changing much at all. Contract factory, we can't change anything. Car factory, what can we change? It looks like it'll take zero months to hire up all of our workers, so we may as well get stricter and get higher quality workers. Buy up the last bit of tooling quality. Let's see, we're spending two million on building our car, so really, on, on the engineering that is, development. So really, like uh, the, the most we can spend on our tools it's 200,000. That's nothing, relatively speaking. That's our net income in a month. I'm going to choose whatever value of automation gets me the most number of cars, and that seems to be a uh, 100. Wait, no, there's a sweet spot here. We can automate too much. And it hurts, it hurts our efficiency when we go too far because some parts of our car were designed to be finished by hand. I can spend just $150,000 and get our cost per car way down. Ah, and we can also see that the uh, automation going up has made it easier to hire our workers. Instead of taking seven months to get two and a half shifts, it'll only take three. So let's rip them off a little worse. And uh, just really screw them. That'll get our costs down almost another $1,000. This is going to be way more profitable. 
Or, or that's what I thought. We're actually only saving like $500 per car instead of 1000 But we're going to go from 12 and 10000 to 11 and a half and 10 and a half. We'll be cheaper. Take out a $4 million loan. Uh, we're off to the races. Should also spend more on marketing. Start marketing Hephazia too on print size. 12,000. Market our company's reputation. Uh, good, reliable cars. Our reliability directly. So we come up to a common problem in automation. We use our factory more than it estimated we would land it. The stupid pop-up to pay a tiny amount of money to repair the tools. The exact amount we use instead of the estimated amount. Okay. And, uh... There we are. The Coniglio B is now on sale, and we are... Well, we're not exactly ranking in more money because I lowered the price and our factory is not bigger. But we do have a lot of pre-orders. People really want to buy these things. So the next stop for our company is going to be to build a small factory instead of a tiny factory and uh, make more little changes to our car. Or we've just unlocked front wheel drive. We could try to build a front wheel drive car, although that might necessitate a new kind of engine. Might need a boxer to fit in uh, a longitudinal front wheel drive because we can't do transverse yet. So let's say that everyone in the comment section is the board of directors for our lovely new Coniglio car company that's just beginning to flourish. The early days of post-war Feruinia. Let me know what we should try next to sell the Coniglio or a new model of car. What needs to change? Do we need more trims? And we will try to uh, expand to small factories and bigger sales numbers. 